Grace, peace, and much love to all of you this day in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We gather in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection to give thanks to God for the life of George Wilson Gunn Sr., to receive the comfort of the Holy Spirit, and to proclaim the good news of eternal life in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. In his baptism, George was clothed with Christ. In the day of Christ's coming, he shall be clothed with glory. Listen now to these comforting words from scripture. Our help is in the name of the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble, therefore we will not fear. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear God. As a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you, says the Lord. Let us pray. Benevolent God, we thank you that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die for us and to rise again. Aware of and surrounded by the symbols of your church, symbols that George loved dearly, the table, the font, the pulpit, and the cross. We rejoice that all of these symbols describe your love and declare your gift of life life now and life eternal in your presence. In the resurrection, we have seen that death is destroyed and that nothing can ever separate us from your love in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Help us to trust these, your promises, your gifts of grace today and always, as we remember the life and death of our loved one, your beloved servant, George, Help us to find in you our strength and our comfort. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
sorry. A reading from the prophet Micah, clarifying again the will of God. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with tens of thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Amen. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear unto my cry. Hold not thy peace at my tears, for I am a stranger with thee, and a sojourner, as all my fathers were. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. For I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be, moved, to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Therefore, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me, in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Hello, I'm Roger Wise, Commissioned Pastor of Fletcher Presbyterian Church. George Gunn was my pastor and my mentor and my friend. I'm so thankful today for the blessing that George and Sally Gunn were in my life and in the life of our Fletcher congregation. Our New Testament scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 31 through 40. May God speak to us through his word. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. 
all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in as I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And then the righteous will answer you, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. May God bless the reading of his word. George, ever the poet, loved 1 Corinthians 13 and here uses its echoes and cadence to speak of the role of love in later life. I read portions of his work titled, Love in a Time of Hospice. Love in one's last hours waits patiently for that bright appearing and is gentle going into that dark night. It does not covet the lot of the living, nor does it storm heaven's gates. Love at death's door insists only that love's way be affirmed. It is not irritated with its adversaries nor resentful of its helpers. It does not complain, but rejoices in all that has been and says yes to all that is to come. Love in the twilight bears up, shares the burden of separation, upholds, believes in the words of eternal life, enables, hopes for every promise's fulfillment, embraces, endures all demands to the very end. When I began life with a child's eyes on heaven, I spoke as a child of a heavenly father. I thought as a child of lambs in a shepherd's arms. I reasoned as a child of a mother hen with her brood. When I came to more mature years, I gave up such simple ways of speaking and thinking and reasoning. But now we are looking beyond these dim reflections of reality and are coming to view life and the life giver face to face. Once we knew God in a partial way, but now we know God in God's fullness, even as God has always known us. So faith that brings heaven's joys near to us, Hope that dwells on that distant shore and love that brings God to us. These three abide always, but the greatest of these is the love that brings us to God. Take leave with love.
Well, thank you to Tammy and to Sheldon for that beautiful rendition of Precious Lord, and especially to Wilson Gunn for those um, two extra verses that seem to complete um, that beautiful hymn. Will you all um, pray with me, please? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our rock our Redeemer. Amen. 
If I have the timing right, it was 12 weeks ago yesterday that George and family met with hospice in his room at Givens Highland Farms. I had the privilege to visit George the next day. We spoke about his kidneys shutting down and the options that lay before him to let death run its course naturally or to fight it with all the strength left in him, which might prolong his life by a few weeks or months. And as we contemplated the decision, I spoke these words to George. It really comes down to how much time you want or need to say goodbye. And in classic George style, with a tear in his eye, but a smile in his heart, he said that it might be the right time to let go. We, his family, his friends, his pastors, we all affirm the decisions that George made along the way. Let me live being the best I can be as well as I can, as long as I can be. Let me laugh as long as I can. And he did. He got to say goodbye to all of his children, his grandchildren. He remembered and gave thanks to God for his abundant long life. And as he faced the onset of dying, George truly had no regrets. On my last visit with George in his room there at Limbert, we spoke about hymns and scriptures that had shaped his life. We spoke about children and the great joy and purpose he found in being a father to four very distinct and diverse individuals. We spoke about his oneness with his beloved Sally for 67 years and the true and beautiful knowledge that even though she had left him in 2017, they were still one in spirit. And when our visit came to an end, we held hands and sang the doxology together. George joked later to, I can't, if it was Wilson or Jeannie, one of them, but he said these words, you know that when the pastor comes to visit, especially in a pandemic and sings the doxology with you, your time is over. The faith to surrender to God's grace as death approaches is truly one of the holiest moments to witness. And as George departed from all whom he loved and those who so dearly loved him, he slipped, slipped gently away from this earth. George's life of faith began in the waters of baptism in 1926 at the Westminster Presbyterian Church in Bluefield, West Virginia. But it continued to be strengthened at the table and every table where he served the feast of our Lord's Supper and partook in that simple meal of bread and wine. Has everyone been fed was the question that guided him as he was faithful to his baptismal promises that his parents made for him so many years ago. When I think of George, I think of radical welcoming hospitality. And so when I hear those words again from the prophet Micah and the gospel of Matthew that Roger read so beautifully, I am reminded that one of the best ways to remember a person's life is to remember what that person did with his hands and his feet and his voice and how he sat with us here at Black Mountain Presbyterian Church on Sunday mornings. I will remember what George did with his hands, holding a pen or a pencil as he translated Corinthians 13 and so many other scriptures for a new generation of Christians, making it applicable to everyone who read it. I will remember his fingers, love of holding old stamps and coins. I will remember his feet, 
swiftly moving through college campuses to meet with a college student or a small group. And though his feet were slower and less nimble, those that ushered him into this sanctuary the last few years, every single Sunday, he made his way in through the sanctuary doors to worship his creator. I will remember his arms reaching out to anyone who needed a hug and using them to welcome those on the margins of life during the civil rights. And we must include his voice because we, all of us who knew him, cannot ever forget his wondrous laugh. It went on and on forever. Through his actions, through his love, George widened and lengthened the table of Jesus Christ for it to include everyone. You see, George never related to people according to rank or power or money or prestige. He understood that part of that baptismal call was to bend low and to see the people who were often way too easily overlooked, unseen, and so often unheard. And then he would reach out to them along with Sally and serve them. And how many people's lives and faith journeys he has touched and impacted. He taught us in practical, ordinary, sacred ways how to witness to God's kingdom, to God's love and light by loving as much as he could. So this day, as we come to say goodbye to our beloved George, we give thanks that God's love has surrounded George from the day that he was baptized, really even before he was born, gave him strength throughout his entire life and was the center of many years of marriage, fatherhood, and ministry. And God's love surrounded and upheld him even as his health began to fail in the last two years of his life, God's agape love was always the source of George's hope, and it is the source of our hope today. So let us follow George's lead, looking always to God's grace, grace to let him go freely, knowing, trusting, that he is indeed living into the promises that God has made for him, for every one of us, through the life and the death and the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Well done, good and faithful servant. What God began in you at your baptism, it is now complete in the year 2020. Thanks be to God for the life of George Gunn. Amen. Amen indeed. Thank you, Mary Catherine. A uh, word of introduction on the following reading. My father considered Kenneth Foreman the single most influential of his many teachers and mentors. Dad studied with Dr. Foreman during his junior and senior years at Davidson College. And as circumstances allowed, they both moved to Louisville Seminary in 1947, where their important relationship deepened. They both moved to Louisville that year, one student, one teacher. While still an undergraduate, however, dad was called upon to lead Friday Chapel. A prayer he offered that day caught the attention of Dr. Foreman, who commented afterwards on a catchy phrase, life is so livable. Years later, my father stumbled on a collection of spiritual reflections by his mentor and recognized his own phrase as one of the titles. He also recognized himself in the tale of a young man whose simple prayer became the topic of conversation between angels in heaven who watched and discussed the rising prayers 
of the faithful. In what I find echoing the style of C.S. Lewis and William Stringfellow, I offer Kenneth Foreman's Life is So Livable. From Psalm 90, verse 14, let thy love dawn on us undimmed, and all our life we may be glad and sing. It came to pass on a certain day near the turning of the year that two angels were standing near the throne, one hardened by many golden bowls full of incense that are the prayers of the saints. One of these angels had long watched the rising incense and knew well the life of those on earth. The other angel had but newly come from the other parts of the Lord's dominions. And that angel knew little of the ways of the earth and of its people. As they watched, behold, there arose from one of the golden bowls this prayer. I thank thee, Lord, that life is so livable. Each angel smiled, but not for the same reason. Then said the angel, newly come to the watcher of old times, knowest thou who made this prayer? I do answer the watcher of ancient days. He is a young man and strong, and God has hedged him about with good on every side. He enjoys youth and health and many friends and leisure to do that which his heart desires. And it is well that he thus offers thanks to God. Then said the angel from farther spaces, from what I have learned of life upon this small spinning earth, life is indeed livable for a little space, for a short time. I have heard that for one with blood of youth in their veins, it is a joy even to be alive. For the morning of this young man's days, this prayer is good. Yet from what little I have learned, I fear that this young man may have memories of past things, and this prayer will one day rise up in his mind and mock him. As their worlds weave its spiral round this ever-moving sun, and what Earth's people call age comes upon them, so will it be upon this man too. As sorrow is the lot of all within the circle, of that red and dying star, so grief will come to his dwelling as to every child. It is well that now he finds his life so livable, but not in the years he can say these words with truth. When God has removed the hedges that now compass him and with comfort, with his friends have forsaken him not once nor twice, when he looks back in weariness upon the years of locusts that have eaten, when his hope is frustrated and his dreams forgotten, when the long years have had their way with him and he has grown to be acquainted with grief, what then will he say when he turns his face to God? Nay, the angel who had stood long by the throne, long have I pondered the ways of God, and I have seen that those who walk with God in God's ways, life is livable all their days upon the earth. Some hope of this man may be frustrated, but if above all earthly goals his hope is in God, he is saved by hope, and he shall know that life is always livable. When toil and turning of the years shall have its change, he shall discover that in his days, so shall his strength be ever. When life on earth cannot be had at its own terms, and he must accept life on the terms he would not have chosen. When his head must bow to the wills not his own, and others shall gird him and lead him where he would not go, he shall find that in yielding to God's will, 
life is livable always. Yeah. It is true, said the angel from other worlds, but I have heard also that on this planet, all things have an end and that to every living thing there, death comes at last. How then shall he say when death lay its finger on his beating heart that life is still livable? Death, said the angel, whose care is of this world. Death for those who have been friends of God is but an opener of a door beyond which there is light. What that young man's prayer means now is good and a prayer everlasting for all those who have tasted but the first of life. In that day when his body serves him no longer and death comes at the Lord's will to speed him on his journey far and high. In the fading of, God, of earth's last light shall he see the rising of heaven's dawn. Then shall he know, as now no other upon the planet knows, that life with God is forever livable. He shall know the inner meaning of the prayer of his youth. Every word which was spoken by one of God's own singers, that they are who are satisfied in the morning with God's loving kindness, rejoice and are glad in all their days. Amen. Amen. Six years ago, my parents and I availed ourselves of an opportunity to discern completion of life preferences. This begat a series of meaningful conversations in our family. One exercise included finishing the following sentence. What follows are George's words. What matters to me at the end of life is to be assured and to reassure others that in our baptism, we were joined to God in Christ's life and death and resurrection. Our eternal life is already ours by the grace of God. We are joined to one another in faith and hope that the one who has begun a good work in us will complete it. Love never ends. Where there is love, life never ends. Amen. Thank you, Jeannie. And now we turn to the church's words uh, using um, the affirmation of faith, a declaration of faith from the old PCUS. And these are the same words that were shared um, at Sally's memorial service. In the death of Jesus Christ, God's way and the world seemed finally defeated, but death was no match for God. The resurrection of Jesus was God's victory over death. We do not yet see the end of death, but Christ has been raised from the dead, transformed, and yet the same person. In his resurrection is the promise of ours. We are convinced the life God wills for each of us is stronger than the death that destroys us. The glory of that life exceeds our imagination, but we know we shall be with Christ. So we treat death as a broken power. Its ultimate defeat is certain. In the face of death, we grieve. Yet in hope, we celebrate life. Nothing, not even death, 
can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. O oh Lord, you have been our dwelling place across all generations. Before the mountains sprung from the earth, or you had given form to this world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn us back to dust and say, turn back, you mortals. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past. You sweep them away, they are like a dream like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is refreshed. In the evening it fades and withers. Satisfy us, O Lord, in the morning with your steadfast love, so that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Ever-loving Lord of the universe, we gather today to give thanks for the flow of grace that came to us in the life of George Gunn. For the teacher who brought forth the truth that was transformed into wisdom. For the friend whose laugh we can hear even now. For the counselor who guided souls toward their best desired selves. For the preacher and writer who opened hearts. We give thanks for the colleagues in ministry who together sought creative ways for your grace to be manifest in the parish, in campus ministry, in social justice endeavors and abiding friendships. We give thanks for the father who guided, encouraged, corrected, for the grandfather who took such delight in hosting those small special adventures. We give thanks for the many lives that gave him to us, for the healthcare workers who tended to his daily needs, even as he could not. We give thanks for his teachers and mentors at Macaulay and Davidson at Louisville Seminary, especially for Ken Foreman and Miss Blanche, his grandmothers, for his parents and brothers and sister with whom he stayed close and drew sustenance, for Sally, his wife of 67 years and all the many tentacles of grace that contributed to the man we loved and who loved us, who was daily baptized into the flow of your grace, who was named George Wilson Gunn. We pray that you would come close to us who feel the vacancy that his death has occasioned. Where will we know that grace now? Where will we hear that deep laugh again? Where will we behold the artist framing just the right photograph, just the right brushstroke, just the right rock rescued from the landscape to remind us of some sacred journey? Where will we again know the safety we knew in his presence, the love so close to unconditional? Where will we know again the voice lifted for justice, for the disinherited, for the oppressed, for the poor and disadvantaged, by systems intent on injustice and discrimination? Where will we hear again our own calling to be agents of your grace, love, and justice in a world that is anything but graceful, loving, or just when left to its own means? So come to us, Lord God, in the absence of George and fill the space, we pray. Fill us in some new way we have not known that we may continue the way that George taught us, led us, was for us. Lend us that measure of resurrection hope we need to continue this journey of faith ourselves, inspired by souls like George along our own way. Lend us some new voice along our path, some new smile we might give and receive that might encourage us in this vacant space that we feel in his absence. Lend us some renewal of purpose and witness that we might make of this world something akin to your grace and your love. Give us some deep presence that even in our own shortcomings, our own finite weakness, our own suffering, that when asked how we are, that we, like George, might respond in faith, if not in reality, I am well. 
thank you very much. So, O oh Lord, support us all the day long until the shadows lengthen and the evening comes and the busy world is hushed and the fever of life is over and our work is done. Then in thy mercy, grant us a safe lodging and a holy rest and peace at the last through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant, George Wilson Gunn, Sr. Acknowledge we humbly beseech you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen.
Friends, one of the things that I do now on Sunday morning, since we are not um, in worship, we pre-record here at Black Mountain Presbyterian Church. I will go on long walks with my dog Ridley, and I will listen to the beautiful music of John Rutter. And on my walk this morning, I thought about George most, most of the entire walk. And as I reached the pinnacle or the high point of my walk this morning, the beautiful music um, of John Rutter, The Lord Bless You and Keep You, came into my ears. And so now hear these words as you go out into the world this day. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine down upon you. May the Lord grant you peace, now and forevermore. Amen.